good morning. morning. This week when everyone around us prepares to celebrate Thanksgiving, isn't it wonderful that we have an opportunity in the first day of every week to be thankful? So if you would stand, join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning thankful. We're thankful that uh, we have an opportunity to gather together. We're thankful, Father, that we have your word to study, to help guide us. Father, we're thankful that we uh, have those around us to, to help us worship. And as we worship this morning, may we bring honor and glory to you. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. compassion, a love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me, everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations.
Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. If you're welcome, uh, visiting with us, I hope you feel welcome today. Begin by sharing with you a story. There was a uh, new senator that arrived in Washington, D.C. He was invited to a uh, ruling member of the Senate to his house, and he was kind of figuring out how the city worked, how politics worked, being new to all these different things. And he was standing on the balcony of the senator's home as he was visiting there, and they were standing there. It was in the uh, twilight of the evening, and you could see the Potomac River there as it's uh, just going by. And they looked out, and there was a large log that was floating down the river. The, the new senator said, uh, can you explain to me how Washington works? The older gentleman had been in Washington for a long period of time, and he looked out at that log that was in the water. He said, well, you see that large log there? He said, yeah. He said, Washington is a lot like that log. He thought about it for a moment. He said, well, can you explain what you mean? He said, well, as best I can figure, there's probably 100,000 grubs, termites, bugs of any sort on that particular log. He said, and every one of them thinks they're in control of that log. <laughs> so that's what Washington is kind of like. Today, we're going to be looking at the idea from Quest 52 in chapter 46. How do I stay in control in a crisis? I'm going to answer part of that question right now. We don't. We don't control very much in the moment of a crisis. Now, we can control our response. We can control how we act. But the other things that surround a crisis, we really have very little control over. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not a, a pessimist. I'm an optimist. I generally looked at things on the positive side, a bit of a realist as well. But as I've looked at life of a Christian, and I've looked at life of those that are not Christians, there's the reality that comes to mind that we really aren't in very much control of a lot of things in life. The best we can do is move along and trust the Lord to work in the way that he can and trust him for all things. Now this morning, if you want to go ahead and take a Bible in hand, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. Turn there with me. Mark chapter 14. We're going to be actually in three different places in scripture this morning. We're going to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, actually. Mark 14, verse 53. We'll be there in a minute. What we're considering this morning is, how do you handle a crisis? What do we do in the midst of a crisis? We're looking at the trials that Jesus was facing just before the crucifixion. And there were several of trials that he was going to go through. And as we study that, we're going to ultimately see how Jesus handled crisis and how we might apply that to our own lives. But what we're going to be doing is looking at three folks, three characters, if you would, out of the scriptures. The very first one is the high priest, Caiaphas, his father-in-law, Annas. We'll talk about them a little bit. The second character we're going to look at is Peter, the apostle Peter, how he handled a crisis during the midst of all these trials going on, and then how Jesus handled the crisis that he was in. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And so first of all, let's look at it from this perspective. Caiaphas and Annas, who were they exactly? Caiaphas was the, uh, the high priest at the time when Jesus was going to be crucified. And his father-in-law was a man by the name of Annas. And what we're going to see is that Caiaphas and Annas both controlled crisis by politics. Manipulation of other people trying to control what other people do and say and how they respond. And that's how the other Jewish leaders are going to find as well. We're going to find them acting the same way. And what we're going to see, church, is this the reality. When you're in the midst of a crisis, politics and manipulating other people never works. And we'll see that lived out in this section of Scripture. Mark 14, starting there at verse 53, and let's pray as we start. God, how good it is to gather before your presence. Father, you are forever consistent, and we forever make mistakes, but yet you are so gracious to us and kind, and forgive us. I pray this morning that, Father, as we walk through life, we will have our own storms, our own crises, and we will have to deal with those. Help us to remember how Jesus handled those situations and Father, see the examples of how others didn't handle it very well. 
I ask you to bless your word this morning and your people that have gathered in Jesus' name. Amen. There, Mark chapter 14, verse 53 through 65. Mark chapter 14, verse 50, or excuse me. Mark chapter 14, verse 53. Let's read there. They took Jesus to the high priest, now that's Caiaphas, and all the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law. They came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself with the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave the false testimony against him. We heard him say that I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days we'll build, it, build another not made, of, uh, not made by man. Yet, yet not even their testimony it did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming down of the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Now, let me give you a little bit of background, if you would, and if you'll be patient with me for just a moment. Who is this person, Caiaphas, the high priest, and who is Annas? Now, a high priest for the nation of Israel could serve their entire life by the law, by how it was set up, unless there was some problem to come up where they couldn't serve. But the Romans didn't want that to happen. The high priest was a liaison between the Roman government and the Jewish people. They would be uh, the kind of people that would try to keep peace as best they possibly could. Now, Pilate was going to be an incredibly powerful individual, especially for that region. But the one that held a lot of power was this high priest and anybody related to them, the Sanhedrin, the, the high Jewish court of the Jewish people. Now, oftentimes what the, Jew, the Roman people would do or the Roman government, they would not let a high priest serve for an extended period of time because with time and you ruling, it builds up power. And that's exactly what Rome did not want. They wanted them to follow them and do what they said to do. Now, when you look into the history, if you would, Annas is a very powerful man. He's the figurehead, if you would. He served, from high, he served as high priest from the year 6 AD to 15 AD, quite a long stint. Then following him, he had a son of his that came in and served as high priest just for about 15 to 16 AD. Then his son-in-law, Caiaphas, stepped into the role. And he had a long reign as high priest from 18 AD to 36 AD, a long time. And then Annas had four other sons that followed Caiaphas as high priest. What I want you to see is this. Caiaphas had a dynasty. He was the ruling power. And my assumption is that whatever Annas said they followed through with, even his own son-in-law and his own sons. Matter of fact, I want you to get a picture of how powerful Annas was. John, all the gospel writers record the trials and the arrest of Jesus, but John tells us something interesting that no other gospel writer tells us. Immediately after Jesus was arrested, that nighttime arrest in the garden, this is what John records. So the soldiers and their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus. Watch. First, they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. Did you catch that? Caiaphas is the power. He's the figurehead. He's the high priest. And when the soldiers arrest him, arrest Jesus, they don't take him to Caiaphas. They take him to Annas first. That shows you how powerful he is. Now, hear me. The rest of the Sanhedrin is not there. It's only Annas and Jesus and maybe a few other ruling people. Now, eventually the Sanhedrin would get involved. The ruling council would get involved, but not yet. But they take him to Annas first. 
And then they have this trial, and, and, and it suggested that maybe Caiaphas was out trying to round up some false witnesses against Jesus, maybe some of the other religious leaders trying to set Jesus up. And hear me, they couldn't even get the false witnesses to agree on their story when it came to the trial for Jesus. That's really kind of fascinating. Matter of fact, go back in your Bibles if you would and go back and read verses 55 and 56. Notice what it says there. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. They couldn't find any evidence against Jesus to have him crucified or killed. Many testified falsely against him. But their statements did not even agree. And you see, as Jesus was going through this whole process, he was going to be railroaded into the crucifixion. This was by the hand of God, by the plan of God, but they were still trying to take control of everything that was going on. And here's what's interesting. They soon realized this case was headed south. If Jesus had just remained silent, there's a possibility he could have walked out of that, that courtroom or that, that palace that day, but Jesus didn't. And they finally asked Jesus, said, well, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus spoke and said, I am. The weight of that statement was staggering. That's the name God took for himself in Exodus. When Moses was there and Moses says, who should I say sent me to free these Israelites from bondage in Egypt? And God said, if they ask, say, I am. Are you the Christ, the son of the living God? I am. And then on top of that, Jesus said, well, let me tell you something else. Not only I am, but when God comes, I'm going to be at his right hand, and he's going to come down from the throne of heaven, and I'm going to be there too. They knew this was a prophecy about God coming out of heaven, and Jesus didn't hold back, and the place exploded because of what Jesus just said. Jesus could have remained silent, but he didn't. I am and you're going to see God coming in his glory. And I'm going to be there too. Now what's interesting is Jesus was being railroaded this whole time. And just as we have an order of system in our law, so did the Jews. Now I'm not talking about just the law of the Old Testament. I'm talking about they had a way to handle judicial and religious situations. And Mark Moore pointed out nine different things that they did wrong in this case against Jesus to get him crucified. I want to read a couple of them. One is that Jesus was arrested through a bribe. That was against their law, obviously, through ours as well. He was arrested with no specific charge brought against him. Jesus' trial was held in the middle of the night. That was unheard of. The false witnesses had conflicting stories. They couldn't even agree. Not only that, but Jesus was not allowed to even ask the witnesses that were brought against him a single question. He was asked to incriminate himself. Are you the Christ? The high priest declared a sentence before he even took a vote. You've heard the blasphemy. What are we going to do about it? The charges were char changed when he was taken to Pilate, the governor. And lastly, he was put on trial and convicted and sentenced to death all in the same day. That would be unheard of in our judicial system, and it was in theirs as well. So as I say that this morning, church, look, Annas, Annas and Caiaphas realized this was a crisis that was spinning out completely out of their control. So how did they handle it? Politics, manipulation, taking people and have them lie and control them in the best they possibly can. And we know that doesn't work. I want to show you a picture. This is really kind of interesting. Is that, is that, yeah, there we go. Good. This here is called an ossuary. Anybody ever heard of an ossuary? Raise your hand if you have. A few of you, okay. If you don't know what an ossuary is, it's just a, a stone box or, or it can be made of wood. From about the year 30 AD to 70 AD, there was a common practice amongst the Jewish people. Um, it, when you died, about a year later, they would take your bones and they would put you in a box like this, an ossuary box, and store it away somewhere, kind of like a burial. Here's what's interesting. Do you know whose name is on that box? A man by the name of Caiaphas. 
Well, if you take the dates of when they did this ossuary box from 30 to 70 AD and the number of Caiaphases that were in that area, it's almost certain that this was the Caiaphas' box that had Jesus to be crucified. And I thought it was interesting. Mark Moore pointed this out, and he said, I thought this was so fascinating in the book. We, gave, we have the burial box of the man who put Jesus to death while Jesus' grave is empty. Amen? Isn't that great? We have the box and his bones. But Jesus' grave, church, is still empty. Praise God. And because of that, things change. Now let's go on to look at our next character. Luke chapter 22. Let's turn over there. Luke chapter 22. We're going to turn over there and we're going to look at a man by the name of Peter, the apostle. Luke 22, verse 54. Luke 22, verse 54. Now this is, and again, in that courtyard area, Peter's being questioned about knowing Jesus. And y'all know his response. Then seizing him, they led him away, Jesus, and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and they sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow is with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know him and what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord that he spoke, and before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Common in that arid region. It gets cold at night very quickly. This is in the middle of the night. Again, Jesus' trial is going on behind them. They're in the area of the high priest, that palace area. Peter gathers around the fire to warm himself along with other people. A slave girl, maybe somebody had some connection to somebody else that was connected to this story going on, looked and said, oh, I know you. You are with Jesus. Jesus, I don't even know who that guy is. What are you talking about? Lie number one. Then he goes on a little bit later and there's somebody else. Oh, you're one of his servants, right? You're one of his disciples? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Lie number two. Oh, surely you're one of his followers. You're from Galilee. No, I have no idea. And he went as far to say, by God, I don't know who that man is calling down curses if he did. Lie number three. And then the eyes of the Savior look directly into the eyes of Peter. And he crumbled because he knew exactly what he had done. And the word that it says that Peter went out and wept, he was broken. He wept bitterly with wails because he knew he had betrayed the one, Jesus, I'll die for you. Peter, you're going to deny me. And he did exactly that. And Peter was broken. Peter's world was in crisis. It was spinning out of control. He didn't know what to say. So how does he handle a crisis? He lies. It's easy to manipulate people with lies. Sometimes some of us are really good at it. But you see, it doesn't work very long. God knows everything that's going on. He knows everything about you. And it doesn't take long for people to figure out that we're lying, making up things that are not true. Mark Moore again in Quest 52 said this, the contrast between Peter's trial and Jesus's is instructive. Jesus was in total control even when he was being railroaded. Peter, he lost control when he was trying to take control. What was the difference between them? The answer to that question informs us on how to stay in control in a crisis. Peter tried to manipulate the situation to his own desired outcome by lying. Jesus, on the other hand, 
prepared for a crisis by prayer. So when we end up in crisis, how are we going to handle it? Are we going to try to manipulate people and and get them to do exactly what we want? Or maybe we might lie and say, I don't know anything about that. I have no idea to make the situation be better for us or make ourselves look better. Last character we're going to look at is Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. We looked at this section of scripture last week. Matthew 26, verse 36. Let's read that real quickly. This is Jesus going through this process. And this time he is in Gethsemane. Matthew chapter, or excuse me, yeah, Matthew chapter 26, looking at verse 36. Then Jesus went to his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He's in crisis. Then he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. And keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not what I will, but your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep, not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the body's weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it possible for this cup to be taken away from me, I drink it. May your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. How did Jesus handle crisis? Your will be done. He prayed and he gave over control to God. Isn't it interesting? You and I want to control so much. We want to control the moments of crisis. How did Jesus do it? He turned it over to his heavenly father. God, I can't control it. There's nothing I can do but be obedient to your will by your hands. So church, as we look at that, as you and I walk through life, what is the best we can do? We could could try to manipulate things and control it by politics and power, or we could lie about it, or we can simply say, God, your will be done. May I walk in the path that you have me walk in. May I do the same things that you want me to do. That's how Jesus handled crisis. He looked at all of life that way. A little bit later in this process, Jesus stands before Pilate. He's the governor. He ultimately has the power to free Jesus, and he works at it, but he's unsuccessful because the Jews so desperately wanted to have Jesus crucified. He looked at Jesus, and he was having this conversation back and forth. And Pilate looked at him and said, don't you realize I have the power to life and death before you? I can set you free. Or I can have you crucified. And I love Jesus' words because if I knew somebody had that kind of power over me, I would try to figure out a way out of it. But Jesus said this, and I love what he said. You would have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. He still looks to God. And says, it's not by your power I'm going to die. It's not by your authority. It's by the plan of God that this will be fulfilled. That's how Jesus handled situations. The reality is for every single one of us, we're going to face crisis. I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know if it'll be family problems. I don't know if it'll be sickness. I have no idea. It might be a job. It might be the loss of a home. I don't know. But every single one of us in here is going to face crisis. The question is how will we control it? Jesus said, I'll pray about it and trust God. That's the only thing that we can do. Adrian Rogers has passed, but I used to like to listen to him on the radio. And I liked what he said, and I'll finish with this. Faith is not believing God in spite of the evidence. Faith is obeying God in spite of the consequence. No matter what come, your will be done. Let's pray. God, thank you for the example of our King and our Savior, our Master. 
Father, I thank you that we can look to him and how he followed you wholeheartedly, how he obeyed you and did not back down one moment from being obedient to the things that you had called him for. Thank you that Jesus was willing to go to the cross for every single one of us that's in here and every person that's ever lived. He was willing to die for them and us as well and be obedient to you. I pray, Father, as we finish out today that you be with us as we go into a time of decision. Give those the strength that need to make a decision, that strength, that courage. Help us to follow you each day in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning, please? If you need to come forward this morning and you're not a Christian and you'd like to make that decision, I invite you to come forward this morning. We have a baptistry upstairs. The water's there. If you need to be immersed into the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and his acceptance of you, we ask you to do come forward during this time. Or if you have another decision to make too, we ask you to come forward. Let's sing together.
Jesus was crucified. The Bible says the third hour, which for us, that would be the equivalent of around nine, nine o'clock in the morning. In Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says, and from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. At the sixth hour, which would be close to noon, darkness comes over the land. This darkness was caused by God. After all, it happened at noon, and it was the Passover, which meant there was a full moon. And it lasted for three hours. This wasn't just a natural occurrence. But what did the darkness mean? Well, we, what we have here is that we have the light of the world, Jesus Christ, being extinguished. The life is dying. The word is being silenced. The very one who holds everything together is devoting all of his strength to the task of redemption. It's as if the light has no energy to shine and the word has not the strength to speak. And so it is dark. Because Jesus has taken upon himself the sins of the entire world and paying the price for my sin and your sin once for all. And so this is a time when we pause, we take the emblems of the bread and the cup to symbolize Jesus' body and blood that was given for us there at the cross. And we think about him and reflect upon him and what he did for us that day. And it's with grateful hearts that we take this bread and this cup and look forward to him coming again. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your holy name this morning. You are indeed holy. You're a great father. You're compassionate and kind. And we thank you for this wonderful gift of the Lord Jesus, the one who is willing to pour out his life unto death so that we could live, so that we could be forgiven. And so we thank you for this time that we can remember the one who took our place, who paid our price. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. And it's through him we pray. Amen.
I'm going to ask you to remain seated at this point. Uh, Larry Davis is going to come up and speak for just a moment about upcoming mission. As he uh, makes his way up here, um, a couple of things I did want to make mention. This coming Wednesday, we will not have the adult Bible study that takes place in the, chap- uh, in the uh, lounge at 10 o'clock. I wanted to tell you that, being Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Also, uh, we will be decorating the auditorium in the church building on November the 27th at 9 a.m. That's Monday morning uh, next week. Uh, So don't forget that. And also the church offices will be closed November 23rd and 24th for Thanksgiving. Larry, you don't even have to sit down. I'll just keep you standing. How will that be? There you go. Larry wants to mention something about an offering coming up. Man, I cut him off there, didn't I? Uh, First of all, I want to introduce myself. We have several people that that are new here, and and I thank you. My (laughs) my name's Larry Davis, and... uh, I'm the chairman of our missions ministry here at Central Christian. And if you'd like to be a part of that, just let me know. We, we always want to have new people involved in it. It's a, uh, we are a very giving church, and uh, if you feel led to that, please let us know. Uh, this, this Thanksgiving, we decided that we wanted to do something a little different. You know, we try to, we try to support people out of town, out of country, and in town. And this, uh, we looked at a need here that we have, and we, we focused on the city mission. The city mission has a ministry where they provide a place for homeless people to sleep. Uh, they have a building. They have 16 beds in it, and these people get there at night at 8 o'clock, and then, they're, then they have to leave the next morning at 8 o'clock. Now, they may start going earlier as the... Uh, as the Time has changed and it gets colder. But those people don't get any food or anything because they, they don't have the facilities to be able to do that. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> so uh, a couple of people that I know uh, have, provi- have started a ministry to take care of that. Charlie Stevens and Linda Whitehead uh, Williams, if you know, Linda Williams Whitehead, if you know her, they, what they do is they provide a meal every evening for the people that go into the mission. And it's done in conjunction with the mission. Uh, they cook meals for 16 people. Now, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to cook a meal for 16 people at this point. Maybe someday I might do that. But right now what we're going to do is we're going to take the money that we, that we collect for this and we're going to, We've, I've talked to a local restaurant who's going to help us take a meal down uh, once, as, for as often as we need to take it down until, we're, until we run out of the money that we have. So if you want to participate in that and providing a meal for these people, that's what our offering is for this year. And uh, I think it's a great, facility, uh, great uh, opportunity to, to, to meet a need. You know, I don't know how many of you really know how much homelessness there is in Ironton, but just look around and it'll absolutely amaze you. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity. So I appreciate your participation and thank you for sit, being such a giving and uh, thankful church congregation. I appreciate you, everyone. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate you doing that. And uh, you can go ahead and stand now if you'd like to. Uh, just as I mentioned that, um, what you can do if you'd like to, if you'd like to make a check. You can do that Central Christian Church, and in the memo, put City Mission, and that way you'll know, we'll know what that's for. So, and if you have any questions about Hippo Valley, which we were collecting for as well, you can catch me on that. We're still collecting funds for that. Okay, a couple of things before we dismiss. Thank you for being here. Uh, do want to remember Doris Roberts in our prayers, Pauline Nunley, Bill Goslin, Buck Browning, Phyllis Fairchild, and Paul and Ju- Julie Fugit. We've got a lot of folks with a lot of sickness, uh, a lot of health issues, uh, so make sure you remember them in your prayers. I know they'd appreciate it. Or if you're a card sender, you could do that as well, or a phone call. Let's pray before we go. God in heaven, we thank you that you hear us, you love us. Thank you for blessing our lives, Father. We have uh, food to eat, uh, uh, shelter. Uh, Father, that we could stay warm in and cool in the summer and just all the blessings that you abundantly pour out on us. I pray that we would be a giving people, a loving people. I pray, Father, that you be with these folks that have been mentioned today. Their needs are great. There are other needs here, Father, that aren't aren't even mentioned, but I pray that you be with them as well and give the folks strength, Father, as they carry through their difficulties. Thank you for your love, your grace. May you dismiss us in your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.